Okay, hi everybody. Um, first of all, I, I'm really humbled to be here. Um, let me tell you a little bit of personal history. Uh, I got into this work uh, in grad school and um, at some point I really needed help of uh, people whom I would have called at that time experts. Uh, I still do. And uh, on wisdom, uh, I emailed them and I asked them to, to participate in a study. Now the list I got from the Defining Wisdom Network. And so a lot of people who are either here in the audience or maybe watching online um, did uh, do this voluntary study, which uh, really uh, pushed me forward and uh, helped uh, with my research agenda. So thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I would like to ask, uh, start to ask with asking this question. How can we enhance wisdom? Question that probably many of us uh, here today care about. When I think about this question, I think about um, Solomon the third king of the Jewish kingdom, who is apparently the exemplar of wisdom. Now, as in this example, Solomon is uh, easily able to discern the truth who is the mother of the child. What I find interesting about uh, the anecdote about uh, the life of Solomon is that his life was not uh, very happy after all, not very wise, one could say, uh, when it came to his personal problems. Solomon, um, being the chief priest of the Jewish kingdom, had about 500 wives, all pagan, preaching to their gods. He was a busy man, one could say. Um, Solomon also didn't spend much time educating his son. Uh, he also liked to brag around about how much wealth he had to people who could easily conquer him. And so by the time the kingdom was passed on to his son, it quickly led to the kingdom's demise. Now, what is interesting about this story is that it's a, it suggests something really interesting uh, from the psychological perspective, uh, namely that um, wisdom may actually vary as a function of the situation, and that the level of wisdom may be uh, uh, dependent on the level of ego involvement. Many of the things, by the way, that I will say in this talk, in this brief presentation today, have also been echoed in multiple ways uh, in comments uh, uh, throughout uh, our meetings. So um, if you th think that you have this kind of uh, um, a repeat of some things, uh, that's probably because many of us share something in common, and that's great. Now, psychologically, this insight is really interesting uh, because it does not only mean that, well, there is no unified wisdom, maybe, uh, or there is no exemplar of wisdom, as I would bravely say here. Uh, but instead of that, that uh, we can also possibly alter the view on the situation, and by that, maybe make some people wiser, and others uh, less so. Well, hope, hopefully we go for the first one, of course. Uh, and that, in turn, can give us some insights about how to teach wisdom. Now. I'm a social psychologist, so I'm really interested in the question of how situation may impact uh, our ability to reason, our experience, our emotions, and so on and so forth. So when I started doing this research, I quickly found out that there are a lot of methodological challenges in the way how wisdom is measured and operationalized that may prevent us from gaining uh, a good insight about how situation may impact uh, the level of one's reasoning or one's wisdom. Uh, the problem is that many of the current methods that exist to measure wisdom uh, make this trait-like assumption that you can measure it by asking some abs abstract questions. Now, I'm not criticizing this as, in general, I think this work has been very instrumental to s spread uh, the, uh, the ways to measure wisdom so that many people can do that. And that has been uh, really fundamentally important. And we gained a lot of insights about possible developmental trajectories and so on. But if you want to understand uh, how uh, the situation impacts one's ability to reason wisely or not, we have to go beyond that. We need to measure behavior, because if you just look at the trait-like measures, uh, uh, you're facing with a problem that social and personality psychologists have been talking for 20 or 30 years, namely that you will be basically uh, completely oblivious to the situational contingencies, uh, to the question of cross-situation variability. And by that, I do not mean just test-retest variability across different measurement points. 
I mean that you really measure people in different situations in their daily lives. Through that, we can get more insight about how to uh, uh, maybe develop teaching curricula and so on and so forth, because then we can construct the situations that can help people. Now, fortunately, of course, there are many other domains uh, in, in which researchers operated for a very long time where they looked at behavior, uh, specifically behavior that may be related to wise judgment. If you go back to the very original studies by Vivian Clayton, she talked about that wisdom entails uh, forms of reflection about understanding paradoxes, contradictions of life, uh, principle of paradox and change. If you look at the more recent uh, demonstrations uh, by uh, Paul Baltus and by Ursula, who's here in the audience, uh, we see that in this paradigm also, people reflect on uh, uh, problems uh, uh, that uh, they think through in the moment. And uh, we ex again examine things like contextualism, relativism, and so on. In the 80s, there was the whole developmental program in human development literature oriented towards relativistic and dialectical thinking. This is just one example from Michael Bastridge. There are many others uh, where people talked about uh, asking uh, individuals to reflect and then examined their reflections in a moment, in a particular situation. So when I started my work in this domain, I tried to sort of uh, get a sense of what can be measurable uh, in the domain of social conflict uh, from these different uh, perspectives. And we came up with this uh, non-exclusive list uh, of things like um, intellectual humility, recognition of limits of one's knowledge, uh, consideration of multiple perspectives, uh, consideration of different ways uh, things may unfold, recognition of change, uh, and uh, more pro-social tendencies that uh, Bob Sternberg is talking about, sort of orientation towards the common good as in, in the form of uh, search for conflict resolution, search for compromise. Not, I'm not talking about wisdom in general. I'm talking about specific subset of categories that are really somewhat linked or have been discussed by researchers as related to wisdom. I'm talking about reasoning. Now, these tendencies seem to cohere well together. They are not much related to uh, crystallized or fluid intelligence, a little bit to crystallized intelligence as predicted. They are somewhat related to uh, your well-being. Uh, people uh, a little re reflect in a, uh, being more satisfied with their life, report less negative affect, uh, reflect uh, having better relationship quality, so to say. But do, they do are not Pollyanna. They are not saying, my life is happy place. Now, using this paradigm, I would like to get back to this question about Salman's paradox. In one test uh, that uh, we did, we just asked a sample of students who are in the relationship to reflect on the conflict in which they imagine their, uh, their partner having sex with their close uh, uh, friend. Or imagine a similar situation happening uh, to the friend. And then we ask them to reflect on the situation and report on what kind of tendencies uh, that occurred to them. As it turns out that for each single component of what we would call this uh, wisdom-related reasoning, recognition of limits of knowledge, compromise, others' perspective, and change, those who reflected on the friend were more able to produce this form of reasoning than those who reflected on the self. By the way, this is not related to social desirability bias. Now, why this may be the case? Well, if you think about it, uh, thinking about the friend is like uh, taking yourself from a distance. When you think about the self, you have this tunnel vision. You narrow your focus. Whereas when you think about the friend, you have this kind of third person distant perspective where you see the context and maybe what you did to make the person uh, so angry at you. And in a way, this is what people in uh, research on emotional uh, regulation uh, talked about, uh, as well as on, uh, in cultural psychology. They found out that people who take third person perspective tend to see more big picture also tend to uh, reason about the emotional experience in a less egocentric way. And if so, maybe we can actually attenuate the Solomon's paradox by asking people to reflect on themselves in the third person. And so this, well, that's what we did in another study. We did the same manipulation, self or other, your partner's uh, uh, infidelity or friend's partner's infidelity, but the, then we also crossed it with another manipulation which we either asked people to use first person pronouns or, or third person's pronouns. What would Igor do? How would he react to the situation? And then we looked at the same type of responses, and as it turned out, as we replicated the Solomon's paradox uh, among the self and others when people were immersed, which is what Americans, at least, uh, naturally tend to do. However, 
those people who talked about themselves in the third person didn't show any of this effect. In fact, their level of bias reasoning was on the same level. Now, we, since then, we've replicated this on thousands of participants. Uh, we have uh, done studies uh, uh, with different manipulations, uh, visual, uh, this is linguistic, um, uh, spatial. I would like to present to you one more last one before I can conclude. Uh, the spatial one, where we extend it to the societal domain. Uh, here, in a study that was done with highly polarized participants, they read uh, statements of Democratic and Republican Party two weeks before the 2008 presidential election, as you remember, highly contested. And then they focus on two issues they mainly care about. And in one condition, uh, they take the perspective of US citizens living in the US, their habitual perspective. In another one, they take the perspective of an Icelandic citizen living in Iceland, really far away. And then they have to imagine something that they really don't want to imagine, namely, how will each issue develop if the candidate you don't endorse will win the election? What will happen if McCain will win the election? Oh, I'll go to Canada. <laughs> you remember that, right? Like a lot of people are saying that. Uh, turns out that here, when we look at uh, how people reflect, this is uh, transcripts, uh, those who distance, uh, uh, think about being in Iceland, uh, report uh, greater limits of knowledge, greater recognition of uh, world influx and change. We also ask them uh, if they uh, sort of had a measure of cooperation, would they be willing to join a bipartisan group uh, discussing political issues on campus? If so, leave their email. One third of the people in the distant group left their email, only three participants in the immersed. And in fact, the tendency to reason wisely was uh, partially accounting for this tendency. The reasoning uh, wisely was related to this openness to diverse uh, views and cooperation, and uh, uh, in such that condition effect on openness was mediated through wise reasoning. Now, just to conclude, what I present to you today is that focus on reasoning and behavior, and this is what I would like to encourage all of us in this uh, symposium to think about, can help us to understand how to enhance wisdom. It's not sufficient to just look at some kind of idealized traits. It's not sufficient to think about some exemplars. We have also to consider what psychologists have been uh, dealing with from the very beginning, the behavior, the situation. And uh, we also, uh, also uh, demonstrate to you that wise dream is linked to cooperation and well-being. Preliminary evidence from the hypothetical stories, uh, hypothetical scenarios suggest that uh, when people reflect on problems of others, they seem to uh, show greater wisdom than they when they reflect on their own. Self-distancing seems, seems to promote that. But of course, there are many others that I encourage all of us to work on. And uh, currently, we're extending this to uh, real conflicts. And we have preliminary evidence on half a thousand participants or so that it actually works for uh, actual conflicts in the di uh, daily life. Now, I would like to acknowledge a few people. Ethan Cross has been involved in uh, the majority of the projects that I present to you today. He's a fantastic uh, person and uh, 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 another individual who was very important and dear to my heart is Richard Nisbet, who uh, was uh, my advisor during my graduate school in Michigan and who instigated me to uh, uh, examine the question of wisdom, as well as many, many others. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, Monica? Oh, Monica first, and then. Um, I just um, have a question in terms of, so basically what you're saying, Igor, right, is that uh, wisdom depends on the context. Yes, as many other uh, personality uh, components or anything they do in psychology. Right, so one, one question that I would have is what do you think for someone who is an exemplar of wisdom, so truly wise, this ideal image of a wise person. I don't know such, would, a, per would they, such a person exists. Because they're very rare, right? But if they, would, if they do exist, would you think it also depends on the context? I mean, in some ways, I completely agree with you that, it, that, that, that wisdom probably depends on the context for many people. Mm -hmm. But I would say that for those who are really ideally wise, that they are probably wise independent of context. I mean, and again, this is an empirical question, right? That would be interesting to look at those who, for example, score really highly on the, you know, the self-administered wisdom scale or the, the, the 3DWS, 
if they are more, uh, if, if they are, scores are more robust across different situations than for those who score lower? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there are two answers to your question. Uh, number one, you know, yesterday night I was uh, rereading uh, Life of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, who is apparently uh, considered one of the uh, wiser e e Enlightenment intellectuals who, you know, influenced uh, people and uh, uh, pro w was the hero of the French Revolution. Um, the main piece of Rousseau was, as you probably know, about uh, uh, child rearing. Rousseau uh, was not fond of children, personally. He gave them up. Uh, he gave up his first children. The other piece about Rousseau was that uh, he was saying that you should be less egocentric, that you should be uh, focusing on reasoning and, uh, pr and pro-sociality. Rousseau was one of the most egocentric people you may think of uh, uh, from that time. A human, in fact, tried to be a very good friend of his. And his. Anyways, uh, this so is just anyways, another so example. So but what I'm trying to he's say a, is he's that he's an exemplar of wisdom or not? He, he would be an exemplar of wisdom well, for I many intellectuals. No. I would say no. And, 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 this is, and this is where it becomes a tricky issue. You know, I'm uh, much humbler in the, in the regard, I'm not interested in finding out the, the pure wisdom. I'm interested in making people in their everyday life act in a bit wiser fashion, as many people here said. And so I, I think uh, we, we can try to go for uh, the exemplars, and I think that's a very interesting enterprise, but uh, it would not be the one that I would take on myself. The other answer to your question about uh, with respect to three-dimensional wisdom scale and other scales, people who score very highly on all dimensions of that scale, in my opinion, are suspect of just being coherent in terms of the uh, very high social desirability bias. Um, I was, so I'm wondering how long, if you have any evidence speaking to how long lasting these um, effects are, if they're yeah. specific to the situations in which you're, you're testing them, the paradigms, or if then they go on to make other wise judgments. And, and this sort of relates to the, the previous question because um, I'm wondering the extent to which, uh, it, is wisdom something that some people we, we've been talking about it as very much uh, a trait concept until this talk, and so with, with modifications, right? But is it, that, is it the case that someone is a wise person and they can get more wise? Or is it that you could take someone who does not have many of the characteristics of a wise person and make them wise? Okay, so I think there are two, somewhat, like two questions I'll mm -hmm. try to very briefly wrap up. We don't have evidence uh, yet how long-lasting the effects are. It would be very interesting to look at that. Uh, with respect to the second one, um, so you're asking sort of like which effects are stronger, uh, trait or state uh, level effects? Is, is that sort of? Um, I guess I'm asking more, I mean, you can think of uh, there are attractive people and there are people who can make themselves attractive by having a nice haircut or makeup, right? And this is like, can, is it that people are wise and, or is it that these people use these like these almost like wisdom hacks to be perceived probably in the domains uh, that they are viewed as exemplars of, uh, I, I don't know if they would be viewed as wise in other domains. And uh, so far, I've seen at least as much variability within people as I've seen between people. So uh, I don't know if we have actually evidence of consistency, even among the greatest exemplars of whom we would think and think of. Albert. Yep. Yeah, Igor. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for the talk. Um, I have a question about the relationship between distance, uh, the psychological distance and emotionality, and how these two components relate to wisdom. So is it your claim that by, take, by reducing the emotionality that the situation creates, you become more wise? No, uh, I claim that by changing the frame of reference from the habitual one that you have uh, to a different one that you normally don't engage in, uh, you may be able to tackle the emotionality. I can even imagine that people who are uh, uh, engaging in the strategies and are acting in a wiser fashion would be even more emotional, but they would be handling this emotionality in a different way. We have some preliminary evidence to that. All right, now, uh, can you make a relationship between that and the foreign language effect that they presented this morning? So is the same yeah. mechanism there? Uh, if what? Could, could it be the same mechanism, this idea uh, it, it of... Could, it could be a very similar mechanism, yeah. Uh, I, I, think it's, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's more distancing than emotions, yeah. So Mark and then Ursula. 
and then but Mark, and then Priscilla. Thanks, Igor. I was just wondering uh, two things. So one, uh, are, there, are there predictors of sort of when people will use distance versus immersed perspectives? And two, um, you know, aside from these experimental manipulations where you sort of tell people to take one perspective, mm -hmm. what are some more subtle sort of environmental or situational variables that yeah. we can do to, pin to manipulate how people yeah. will, which perspective they'll take? Yeah. So the first one, we don't really have, uh, at least according to my knowledge, uh, maybe Ethan has done something new, uh, we don't really have a very clear indication um, uh, about what are the conditions under which people are more likely to wa use one or another. Um, there is some work in the motion regulation where people say that reappraisal strategies could be uh, used when it's uh, somewhat easier and, and a dis let's say distraction strategies are used when it's really hard, when you're under high cognitive load, for instance. Uh, it's an empirical question if it extends to, uh, to this work, but that could be sort of one initial attempt to address that. Um, now, the other one uh, about more subtle ways. Well, we can think of, uh, I mean, of course, uh, training uh, people to use third-person language uh, or to imagine themselves visually to be somewhere else is uh, not that easy. I, I think to some extent it may be easier than to train them to meditate, but that's a different uh, story. Um, I think uh, uh, one of the uh, simple ones, and we, again, have just very preliminary evidence for that is, uh, but fascinating. Uh, if you ask people to, uh, it's kind of related to the uh, talk on uh, explaining things. If you ask people to give an advice to somebody, they tend to automatically take a third person perspective. And uh, in fact, we have some evidence that uh, through that, they also are much more likely to act in a prosocial way and reason in this forms of uh, wisdom related reasoning. So maybe that one would be a, a simple intuitive strategy, but we, we need some more work on that. Thank you, Igor. Um, I want to come back to your issue of consistency uh, within people. Uh, we found helpful in our work to make a first very basic distinction, um, which is between personal and general wisdom, uh, which you referred to with your dimensionality of ego relatedness or whatever you called it. And then when we look within general wisdom uh, and we go within our paradigm across different task domains, we have used uh, tasks from the professional domain, the health domain, the family domain. Uh, we find roughly 20% in the raw score variance is attributable to between task differences in level of performance, but the major share of the variance, roughly 50%, is still with the five criteria, mm -hmm. which for me makes a lot of sense. Uh, so we have some contextual variability which we would need uh, to be, you know, adaptive, but you have this common core of what one might want to call wisdom-related judgment and insight. I also think we need this consistency because some of our precursors of wisdom-related judgment and insight are of a very general nature. So let's just elaborate a little bit on the very exciting stuff you've talked about in terms of emotion regulation. So we don't have enough evidence yet, but I'm very much convinced that if we find good paradigms to study it, we would find that people who have higher levels of wisdom-related um, judgment and insight have a very particular setup, social neuroscience setup, mm -hmm. of how to process and to handle emotions in their brain. And you would expect that that kind of emotion processing is not changing completely between situations. Yeah. There may be variations, uh, but not completely. So I did not understand you to say you don't expect any consistency. Right, uh, and thank you for clarifying that. What I mean to say is that uh, in order to be able to measure the situational ver uh, versus uh, general uh, tendencies, we have to start with measures that are sensitive to situation instead of assuming right away that, uh, that it's abstract because otherwise you will be, never be able to get at the situation in the first place. But of course, you can aggregate. In fact, I, I have evidence showing that uh, there is, of course, consistency as in your work uh, and there is variability. Uh, just like we should not neglect one on the, instead of the other. 
Absolutely. One last question. Hi, so I really like your finding that um, when people are reflecting on problems of other people, they tend to be wiser and experience less tunnel vision compared to um, reflecting about their own problems. I was wondering if you ever looked at um, the same hypothesis in a group of East Asians, because if you look at the cross-cultural literature, you could see that there's more self-other overlap in East Asians, right? So in that case, maybe reasoning about other people is a more habitual process, and in that case, they wouldn't actually be wiser. Uh, well, thank you for pointing out the cross-cultural aspect of this. Uh, and this is, by the way, cross-cultural aspect is another component of uh, contextualism uh, that we have investigated and have evidence for uh, people in different countries that are more habitually uh, likely to engage using third-person perspective, uh, think holistically if you want, uh, to, uh, among younger adults, score higher at least than among the Americans. Uh, we have the case example of Japanese versus Americans. So I'm not sure if we can talk then about the wisdom, but at least with respect to these reasoning strategies, we have evidence that's correct that uh, across cultures, those cu uh, cultures that seem, at, uh, according to other studies, uh, seem to be engaging in these strategies habitually, are uh, more likely to reason in this way habitually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.